Hey, everybody that's uh, participating and watching, uh, welcome to the meeting for December 4th, 2014 for the Open Bitcoin Privacy Project. Uh, basically, we are an open source global organization, and our mission is to improve financial privacy within the Bitcoin ecosystem. Um, so today, um, I'm Christoph, and we also have Samuel here as well from uh, Open Bazaar, and uh, we may have some people joining a little bit later in the broadcast as well. Um, how are you doing, Sam? I'm doing pretty good, recovering from some uh, Thanksgiving break illness, but uh, I'm over oh, the hump. Yeah, yeah. My family's doing really well. They're, uh, I've got three children, and they're quite loud in the background, so I'll, uh, I'll probably stay muted <laughs> just so I don't interrupt. But, uh, yeah, I'm doing well. Cool. How is, um, how is Open Bazaar going, by the way? Overall, it's going pretty well. Um, we actually just put out a blog post today. Brian Hoffman, our project lead, did where he uh, he clarifies some of the issues we've been having recently with the team. Um, basically, long story short, you know we've we've had a lot of contributors to the project over the past eight months that Open Bazaar has been working, and now we've had a few of the more prominent people step back a bit, uh, hopefully temporarily, but uh, they're busy with other projects. And so we just want to be honest with the community about, uh, you know, <clears throat> who's still doing what and uh, and all that. So it's it's still going well. I think we're still on track to put out a, a full release in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, but it's just not going to happen as quick as we hoped. Uh, but if there's anyone out there listening who is a developer who is just interested in the idea of, you know, decentralized markets, you know, we would love to have to have you uh, come check out the project. And are there uh, particular skills that you're looking forward? Uh, this is going to be later uploaded to the uh, the World Crypto Network, um, so you may get a people a few people viewing through that. Are there particular skill sets that you're looking for for Open Bazaar? Yeah, definitely. The biggest gap right now is in networking knowledge. Uh, we're actually looking specifically to see if we can take the peer-to-peer -peer network that we use right now and basically put it on to more of a BitTorrent network, uh, specifically maybe using LibTorrent uh, to do that. And anyone with knowledge of, of networking in general or torrenting specifically would be very helpful. Right now, we use a, a distributed hash table network similar to, to Kademlia, um, and that may fit our needs, but it's sometimes a little difficult. We want to make sure it's that it can use Tor, and sometimes it makes it a little difficult for uh, for peer discovery and whatnot. So networking is a big need. Um, the other need is uh, graphical um, design, and uh, we wanted to have a new graphical interface done by Beta 4.0, uh, which would be coming out any time now. Uh, but it looks like that's going to be delayed. So we need we need more people on the graphical interface too. Very cool. I've been um, lately doing some work with um, these. Uh, Oh, sorry, with the uh, people that are um, doing Bitcoin Dark, and um, this, it's uh, like tied into a bunch of other technology, SuperNet, and just like all kinds of stuff. But I'm sort of looking at their privacy technology, and one of the interesting things about what they're doing is um, they create, rather than using Tor or I2P, they've created their own peer-to-peer -peer network for secure private communications, and... Um, it's also Kademlia based as well, um, but uh, yeah. So th it seems like there's a lot of projects that are using this kind of Kademlia style distributed hash table stuff lately, and you know even BitTorrent obviously is heavily based on that as well. So very interesting stuff. I think that I personally think that the two most important data structures so far for the century were are the, basically the the blockchain and distributed hash tables. I think they have they stand to make the, the largest effect on the world. So, cool stuff. And do we have uh, Chris uh, jump in and join? Yeah, I'm here. How you guys doing? Doing well. How are you? Good. Cool. How's, uh, how's development on your wallet going? Uh, it's, it's not going bad. We put out a you know, newer version uh, this week. Um, 
Not bad overall. Um, just kind of slow. We're still looking to uh, see if we can't work on it full time, which would be nice. But other than that, it's not bad. You're looking for investors right now for that, or what? Um, yeah, we got a couple things maybe in the works. We'll see how they go. Okay. What kind of stuff did you guys push out in your latest version? Uh, it was mainly uh, updates to how the uh, the Android app and wallet uh, connect to each other, like some networking fix with the new UPnP library and stuff like that. So it's working a little bit better. We added um, um, my current uh, Rhoda library called Update FX, which uh, um, he uses in his uh, Lighthouse wallet, or will be using or in that is that um, uh, handles like automatic updates, so that when you you uh, open up the wallet, it it checks to see if there's any updates, and it can download it and install it automatically. So okay, nice. We still we still have to get the uh, um, Linux version uh, working though, because the Right now, it's uh, you can only run a, a runnable jar on Linux, and it's uh, I don't know. I'm I'm having a hard time building the uh, self-contained package. It keeps crashing on me, but we can't use the uh, update FX on on the Linux version yet, at least until we get a self-contained package for it. Right. Do you um, people that want to use your wallet do they have to open up like a port at their router or uh, how does that work? Yeah, well, um, to use it with regular addresses, you don't have to do that. If you want to set up the um, like the two-factor authentication with the Android app, um, you, even there, you don't need to necessarily set up, a, uh, open up a port if, uh, as long as the um, the uh, phone and and the wallet are on the same Wi-Fi. Okay. Um, <clears throat> But uh, if they're on uh, if they're on different Wi-Fi, then then you need to use uh, uh, either UPnP or port forwarding. Right. Okay. That's what I figured. <clears throat> Very cool. Cool. Well, thanks for that little update. Yep. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, what did you think uh, this week? There was a lot. There was um, I don't know a bunch of, of uh, coverage of blockchain and some thefts that have been taking place for blockchain users through Tor through man-in-the-middle attacks. Did you guys have any uh, thoughts on that news story? I think um, it's, it's very interesting to see. I was a little bit concerned that it was going to steer blockchain away from Tor, but then they made the very wise move of opening up their own uh, hidden uh, service I guess they're not calling it a hidden service because it's not hidden for them, but uh, you know their own onion dot onion uh, domain name for the website, and um, I saw they had this consultant that came in that helped them set up uh, SSL certificates for the dot onion domain and, and all this stuff, which is really cool. And um, I was I'm going to write a blog article about this, but I was thinking, you know, it's. I, I imagine it was quite helpful for Facebook to deploy their own Onion site because it really um, puts out the message there that it's okay to do this as a business and not be considered, you know, Silk Road or um, something along those lines. You know that this is a standard business practice at this point for mainstream businesses, and I think it's really interesting and really neat to see that. Um, I know that blockchain really wants to. They don't want to be identified with the so-called illicit actors or bad actors in the Bitcoin sphere, and they want to be really focusing on mainstream adoption. So um, it's just really interesting to see, to me, the way that the politics are working out in the Bitcoin space with regards to things like Tor and, and I2P and so forth, because they're a little bit on the taboo side, but lately, I don't know, we're seeing some positive indicators there, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it was neat to see them uh, open up uh, a hidden domain. And I think it said they were only the second 
um, person to have an SSL certificate through an onion site after Facebook. If that's true, that is that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm curious, do we do we see a lot of these issues uh, with other web wallets? I mean, I know uh, are we just assuming that this has become a problem because blockchains by far the largest web wallet, or you know, has this happened elsewhere? I personally haven't seen reports of that happening with other web wallets, but I would assume that it is. Um, and just we haven't heard about it because of less volume for those particular websites. I'm actually working on a tool to detect um, these man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, pretty simple. It just connects to, you give it a URL, and it connects to uh, that URL through every single exit node that's available. They're all publicly listed. And, um, and then it compares the results to look out for um, outliers. So yeah, I think it's going to be a problem for a little while, but uh, hopefully things like this tool will encourage companies to up their game a bit. And yeah, it's not a bad idea to block Tor exit nodes and just open up your own uh, .onion domain. I think that's a pretty reasonable approach for some, anything that's authenticated. So um, I wanted to go through this document a little bit today, but before we jump into that, is there anything that either you, Samuel, or Chris would like to bring up? I think I'm good. Yeah, nothing on my end. Okay, cool. Um, well, thanks to both of you for giving me some feedback on this. Um, so we're not going to go through all the stuff that you already looked at, obviously, but I just wanted to... Um, kind of briefly update on where I'm at and see if you guys had any um, stuff that you wanted to throw out today. So I'm going to share my screen now and so you can see the doc easily and uh, other people can see it as well. So we had this like list, this like disorganized list of criteria and um, I've been trying to turn it into something more concrete. So I sort of separated it into two sections. One is uh, goals that we measure, like privacy goals, uh, for example, generating a new address, which we will measure through uh, the minimum number of clicks in order to achieve the goal. And um, I think that the, the number of clicks thing is going to work out pretty well. There's other ways that you can evaluate user experience, obviously, but a lot of them require you to get a bunch of users to test it, and then you need like a statistically significant sample size and, and all that kind of stuff. You know, if you do your your A/B testing or your time on task likelihood to take action, other stuff like that. So I think this was a pretty good metric. I j justice threw that out there, and I thought it was a good one. Um, so for all of for all of those goals, you're going to be measured in number of clicks. So we have uh, new address generation. Um, specifying a change address, doing backup related things, sender privacy, which is mostly to do with mixing, receiver privacy, which is mostly to do with elliptic curved if Hellman addresses, and then broadcast privacy. And then in addition to the, the things that we're measuring, the number of clicks, um, there's also some like feature checks, I call it. So like things that would not be easily measured in the number of, of clicks. Um, so for example, like Chris pointed out, it is nice if the wallets kind of um, make it, if they, if they hide uh, addresses from the users once they've used them to receive Bitcoins, or if they just make it a little, they make the users go through some extra steps and make it uh, not kind of like not the default, not encourage users to keep using the same addresses. Uh, that can't really be easily measured in the number of clicks. So that's going to be kind of a feature. Um, and some other stuff is like, if you have a key pool, do you warn the user when the key pool has been exhausted to let them know that the backup is stale? Um, does the server is the server needed to kind of um, uh, cult, you know get the the peers to collaborate for mixing and therefore have the uh, the information that they need to de-anonymize the the mixers? Um, that kind of stuff. So those are the two broad categories. So mainly what I need help with at this point is um, I need to do a little bit more fleshing out of a couple of sections, and then I need to decide how to like subjectively weight these, um, 
these different uh, categories. So like, you know, how important is it to privacy to generate a new address whenever you're receiving the coins versus uh, specifying a new change address? I don't know, uh, but we have to come up with some kind of scoring for that. Um, so I'm definitely interested in people's opinions about that. And I guess we can go through these categories a bit tonight if you want. Um, but that's that's one of the main things I need some help with. And obviously, it's something we're going to adjust over time and whatnot, but uh, we need some place to start out. So as far as the scoring goes, some of the things that are being scored are kind of binary. So I was thinking for every individual category or subcategory, just score from 0 to 100. And then the overall privacy score would be sort of a weighted average of all of those together based on the weights that we decide for each category. And uh, so the binary ones, you either get a, one, a 0 or a 100, whether, you're, whether you have it or not. For the things where we're num measuring the number of clicks, I came up with two possible functions to use for this. Um, and I'd be curious to hear from both of you about what you think about these functions or if you think there's a better one. Um, the first one is going to be kind of a, um, it's like a, it's an asymptotic thing. So uh, it based in, so the, the, based on the number of clicks, your score goes down. The best score is going to be 100 based on uh, getting requiring zero clicks. Like basically, this is the default uh, behavior, and the the lowest score is going to be um, uh, zero. But you can never actually hit zero because it it asymptotically approaches zero. So and the way that it's uh, sort of like weighted, I used a value of k equals five for this little graph here. Um, it's basically like x over x plus k. And um, so it's it's weighted such that if you require five clicks to do something, you get a 50 out of 100. Um, that's pretty arbitrary. Um, we can use other values of k, but that's just where I sort of started. So that's one possible thing. The benefit to that one would be, you know, all the scores will be between 0 and 100. And, um, it's uniform, so like we never have to necessarily change this metric in the future. They're not like relative to one another, whereas this next one is, right? So the next one is um, uh, basically 100 would be your best score. Zero is like the worst wallet that we have looked at so far. Um, so let's say we look at uh, the blockchain wallet, for example, and it takes um, 100 clicks to generate a new address, I don't know, then um, they will be the new zero, and everything will fall between that 100 and a zero. And it's evenly sloped between those two. It's just a flat line on the graph between those two, which is kind of nice. Um, but it also means that um, every time we, come, we evaluate a new wallet that's worse than the previous worst one, that's going to change all of the scores for all of the wallets that we've looked at so far, which is kind of annoying. It, it, there's some, I think it's somewhat desirable to have the scores kind of remain the same over time, at least um, respective to like versions of this evaluation process. If we come out with version 2.0, we've tweaked a few things, we reevaluate the wallets, I think that's fine. If the, if the scores actually change potentially each time you evaluate another wallet, that seems somewhat undesirable uh, to me and confusing for consumers and so forth. Um, so those, those are two, at least two ways that I thought about doing it. What do you guys think about the between the two of those? Uh, I would argue um, the, the first one you rolled out makes more sense to me. Um, only for the reasons that you highlighted yourself, but also, um, of course, we want you know we want to put these out and, and sort of show people how you should be using or you know, which one is the most private uh, wallet available. But if we get to a point down the road where the privacy uh, for most of the wallets is you know actually really decent, we don't necessarily want to be saying that one of them is like a really bad for privacy, which the comparative analysis would sort of indicate. So by having an actual objective score that doesn't necessarily change over time, um, I think that's going to be easier to create a baseline from the beginning so we can compare down the road, but also more uh, 
I think, more clear to, to people who will be using the, the scores. Yeah, I tend, I tend to agree with Sam on that one. All right, cool. Um, so I think that's where I'm going to start out. Uh, I may have to fiddle with the K value a little bit at the beginning, but um, other than that, uh, I think that's a reasonable place to start at least. So thanks for your feedback on that. Um, so for you guys, would you would you want to kind of go through these categories a little bit? Would you prefer not to talk about it right now and just kind of look at the document at your leisure? What would you be comfortable with? Uh, it doesn't matter to me, I and mean, we can go through it if you want. All right, let's let's go through it. We won't. Uh, we certainly won't belabor it because I know you guys are quite busy, um, but maybe we can kind of surf through it a little bit, right? So, um, so let's see. So starting with the the number of clicks categories, these goals for particular actions. Um, sorry, let me share the screen once more so you can see. All right, so um, we have new address generation, change, uh, backups, sender privacy, receiver privacy, broadcast privacy. So new address generation is simply like the number of clicks that it takes to, um, when you're sending Bitcoins, sorry, when you, when you tell your wallet like, hey, I want to receive some more Bitcoins, how many clicks does it take to get to the point where you've generated a new address? Um, and the baseline here would be Starting from the default window or your authenticated home page, how many clicks does that take? Uh, so, Christoph, for for an HD wallet, that would just automatically be at zero. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, you well, you might have to like so. Starting from a home page, you might have to go click like a, a receive button or something like that, and then it would show you the address, perhaps. So that would be one click, okay. technically speaking. But, um, but yeah, it's as close to zero as you can get, given the sort of flow. Um, and, you know, for other, ad for other wallets, you may have to do some more clicking. You may have to go to receive and then do some more stuff, or you may have to go to your address book, generate a new address, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, now, obviously, like, that's going to, so that's, it's a rough metric, right, because it doesn't really necessarily capture exactly how much the wallet is steering people towards doing this. So, for example, um, let's say it just takes, like, a couple clicks to create a new address. Well, here's, here's an example. All right, so let's say you have an HD wallet at thing. You have to do receive and then something else, right? To, to get your, so it's already automatically generating these addresses for you, but it takes two clicks because of the, the way the UI works. Let's say there's another wallet that never does this automatically for you, but it only takes two clicks for you to do it yourself. I think that the HD wallet does a better version because it's like it's doing it, it's steering you towards this, you know, these making using new addresses, whereas the second one is not. It's not really captured in this metric. Um, so that's sort of an obvious weakness for me, but off the top of my head, I'm not really sure how to address such weaknesses. Well, I don't know if there's a, there is a perfect way to do it. Um, I, what I'm sure we're going to just come across is we're going to have to run all these metrics through you know, actually you know, using them on a wallet and then seeing what the end score looks like and then just sort of subjectively analyzing if that makes sense because I mean right. in theory right if this becomes a very popular way to rank you know how a wallet is good for privacy and that's a really important aspect that people want we could just be incentivizing people to create a UI where it's one click to do everything on one page right, <laughs> right terrible um, UI design so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly so I, I mean obviously I don't think that's going to happen but we do need yeah. to keep that kind of thing in mind so there are, is there probably most of this will come through trial and error just running it through and seeing what comes out but is there any component to this that is somewhat subjective where we're able to just say based on how all these things mesh together, 
we think this is a more private wallet, or are we trying to get away from that as much as possible? Well, we want to steer away from subjectivity as much as possible, I think, but there are some way there are some ways of um, measuring things in that direction, I think. So like just off the top of my head, we could have a for example, a feature check that's like, um, okay, so it takes this many clicks to do this, but what's the default behavior? You know, for a typical user interaction, what's the end results that's actually going to take place here? That's important to keep in mind. And yeah, maybe uh, it's it's not out of a question down the line to start doing some actual user testing to see how people end up using the wallet. I know a bunch of people. I can grab them and say, hey, go through this checklist of stuff. Let's see how long it takes you to do this operation. You know, Can you figure this, You know, that kind of stuff? That's not out of the question. It's just harder and more complicated and... Um, you know, there's there's very challenges with that, but that would uh, counteract a lot of the the kind of gaming the system that could take place. Um, but yeah, so we can certainly, I think it's I think it's reasonable to say, um, for example, you know, for a typical interaction, does this generate a new address for receiving bitcoins or not? You know, I don't think that's too subjective. I don't think there's a lot of wiggle room to argue there, so um, that's definitely a possibility. I think I'll just briefly make a note of that. All right, so um, that's that one. Change is just... Um, how hard, how many clicks does it take to generate a new change address as opposed to sending it back to one of your receiving addresses or some random address in your wallet that's already been generated, that kind of thing. Uh, backups, how, how difficult is it to create any kind of backup? Um, how many clicks does it take to create a backup after the first new address is generated? And then how many does it take to generate after the key pool has been exhausted if there is such a thing as a key pool? Um, one uh, one question I have about the backup category is, uh, and I guess this would be in the binary section and not the uh, the click section. But do we want to give um, any score to having a uh, seed backup? Because I know in terms of security, like for Electrum, being able to physically write down, you know, your your key, uh, your seed, is I think easier than negotiating, uh, you know, USB to take it from one device to another or something like that. I don't know if you all agree, but I think using Electrum um, on Tails specifically is a really, really easy way to, uh, you know, use Bitcoin more privately right now, at least. So I don't know if that should be something that we want to wait. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... So, hmm. so let me compare two wallets, right? So, like, a, let's say Electrum, where you have the seed, and you it gives you it gives you the seed at the beginning, you write it down, and then you're all set from from that point on. Uh, contrast that with Blockchain.info hosted wallet, where by default they're making as long as you give them an email address, they are sending you automated backups of the wallet to your email address. I think they're password encrypted. I'll have to double check on that, but let's just assume they are for the moment. So in that scenario, they don't have a seed address. I think they do have some kind of notion of a key pool, as far as I know. But um, but the user doesn't have to do anything extra to keep backing up the wallet because it's sort of happening automatically for them via email. So how would you compare those two, Sam? I guess for me, the, the, the privacy part of it uh, means using email is actually sometimes more difficult. So I know like if you're on Tails, maintaining an email address and, and running everything through that is kind of a pain. Um, I much prefer having the seed written down. But I guess to broaden out the question from specifically, you know, do we want seeds, it's more like do is there a way 
to say, are, are we basically saying all backups are equal in terms of privacy? That's the question. Or some better than others. I, I don't know the answer to that. For me, uh, I definitely prefer the, uh, the, the the seed style, but you know, I'd like to hear what uh, if other people agree that that actually benefits privacy or not. Yeah, I agree. I'd, I'd prefer, prefer having it back up to C2 rather than, than sending it in the email. I mean, if you can prevent uh, your your backup from, I don't know, going out over the Internet and, you know, particularly with blockchain where people have a shot at, uh, you know, cracking your password, um, it's a lot better. That's one issue um, that I'm running into with the, the stealth addresses is, you have, um, like, Dark Wallet, for example, because it's a, a server-based wallet, I guess presumably all server-based wallets could kind of do their own handling of of um, of the stealth addresses, but with, like, a peer-to-peer -peer wallet, um, the, the Bitcoin nodes are not yet configured to serve up stealth transactions, and we had a little... There was a thread on mailing lists not particularly related to um, stealth addresses, but just the the notion of using op return for for um, data. And um, and as some people I mentioned in that thread um, that you know talking about using stealth addresses and how they use op return, and at least some people were kind of down on the idea. Of using it, and they're like, "Oh, you should be sending, um, you know, the the nonce for the stealth address in like another uh, communication channel over, you know, basically sending it out of band." And you know, my big issue, and and I mean, sending it out of band, I mean, it, it's, it could be done, but the big issue I have with that is if you send that nonce out of band, then you can't derive those stealth transactions from a seed. Um, because it's not the data that you need is not in the blockchain, um, which kind of sucks. So I mean that's I don't know at least for, for for my wallet's purposes that's something that I'm gonna I gotta try and convince people that it's it's valuable to do it that way because I would much prefer to have everything derived from the seed as opposed to um, I don't I don't know what I would have to do like a cloud backup service or something. Um, you know, if I have to pass that nonce out of band. Right, yeah, that makes sense to me. So with the backup issue, I guess my question is, is it is that a privacy issue or is it a security issue? Um, or is it both? Uh, well, it can I, I can say for me... Yeah, go ahead, mm -hmm. go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, it can be both if if it's not done securely. I know, like, you know, blockchain. You can the way they're doing their their passwords are not like you're you're not doing, um, or at least I should say because it's in encrypting your wallet with a password that most people are using a memorable password. It can be it can be broken pretty easily. Um, I guess if you did it more securely, then it wouldn't be a a privacy issue. But at least at least blockchain doesn't. I think this actually fits also under the uh, identity separation uh, category that is also on the in our metrics, uh, because at least for me, it is much easier to separate identities by having a seed and just pulling in you know a seed when you have your you know when you use another identity basically uh, than it is another otherwise. Because if you then you have to be operating you know, separate I don't know separate emails and, and whatnot wherever whereas you can just write down your seed. So again, yeah, I'd be interested to hear from you know, people listening or, or other folks how they handle either identity separation or how they handle backups securely. Uh, but for me, I would say it is a it is a privacy issue. Yeah, that that's an interesting point. Um, so this is it's really getting into the weeds. Uh, there's a lot of this stuff. It's like. It's it's really it gets really complicated. I was definitely cut by <laughs> bumping into this stuff as I was trying to put it together in a coherent document. Um, but yeah, that's just that's just, that's just how it's going to be. So um, it occurs to me. So for blockchain, they have a mnemonic that when you create your account, you can write that down, 
it won't help you access your bitcoins in another client, but it would allow you to. It would be like a one. Uh, it's a seed of data that you can use to access your blockchain accounts indefinitely. Um, I wonder whether we could treat that the same as an HD seed, or should it be treated differently? Or how long have they been doing that? I I, I must have been using it longer than they've been doing that because I don't remember setting that up when they when they first did it. I think they've been doing it for quite a while. If I if I'm if I'm understanding it correctly, so when you first create the account, there's like a I think they call it a password mnemonic or something like that, and um, so what can you do with the password mnemonic? I think it's just uh, used for their wallet ID, right? I could be wrong. But they, their wallet ID that yeah. they do, um, you know, serve up your, your wallet from the server, I think that's what they're using it for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean. Now. So it's yeah. to restore your user ID if you forget your user ID, is that it? I think it's, so. It's more like an easy. It's like an easier way just to remember your wallet ID. You can just use a, a username essentially. Okay. Right. So backing. So what constitutes a backup? Um, so that doesn't that doesn't yeah. seem particularly equivalent to me to a backup. No, I'd say that probably isn't a backup. Uh, I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't think that will qualify. Okay, that makes sense to me. All right. We can move. We can move on from the the backup discussion. I don't want to hang on any particular sure. issue, but uh, you know, we can just note that it may be worth uh, uh, looking into if if we need to weight different backups differently in terms of privacy. Yeah. Um, to answer your question about how I keep identity separate, I don't really know what the best practice is right now. Honestly, um, I use this arcane like spreadsheet bullshit, um, you know, in a spreadsheet file that I keep indefinitely offline, but it's really quite cumbersome. Um, so I don't know what the the best way to do it is. Most wallets are not addressing the question at all right now. Uh, so as far as helping you keep your identity separate, it's some, you'd have to do your own accounting for that entirely. Um, having different seeds sort of makes sense to me. So what does that look like for Electrum? Is How can you tell whether uh, a given address is from a certain seed or, or not? Like how is that represented on the interface? Uh, I don't know if I remember off the top of my head, but the way I use it is I have... Uh, physical separate hardware, uh, and and I just pull in the seed um, so that I only use on files, that. basically. Exactly, different wallet right. altogether, and then I just go through and look, you know, whatever the transactions were with that. Right. Yeah. So I do something similarly uh, with uh, wallet dot dat files that um, Bitcoin Core generates. Uh, so I, I swap between these wallet files which is a huge pain in the butt, but you can do it. Um, yeah. So I think ideally... So so you... you let's go ahead and put this. Um, so to me, that's like you and me are are doing... are taking advantage of the fact that there's a, an, uh, uh, an abstraction called the wallet. And... Um, but it... As far as the interface goes, it's not helping us do this whatsoever, right? Like the client is not helping us keep our identities separate. That's something that we have, we're sort of exploiting, um, and that other users would, they wouldn't occur to them. The only way I disagree with that is I don't want, I would not go through the hassle of. of dealing with wallet.dat files and on separate hardware and, and whatnot. Uh, I mean, for me, I use Tails for this, and so that's a clean wipe every time, unless you use a persistent section. But um, installing Electrum from a seed is really, really easy. You type in 12 words. Uh, you just have them written down, and that's your on your fresh install of Tails every time. That's really... I mean, I'd like to hear your opinion, but I believe that's pretty secure, and uh, it's also really easy to do. 
So in that sense, um, I mean, it's not in the, I guess it's not technically the graphical interface, but the way the client is built, it's it's very simple to maintain uh, this on Tails. Now, are most of our users, you know, that we're creating this for going to be using Tails specifically? Is it worth, you know, waiting that because of that one use case? I don't know, but uh, you know, for me, it certainly is convenient. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. That's that's a fair point. So it's like one of the, um, you, so we could say basically there's a metric that we can use as, uh, for sep, uh, identity separation. That's like how many steps does it take for you to kind of import a wallet or a seed into the client and load up this identity. If it's a lot of steps, then people are not going to go through all the hassle. If it's a few steps, then maybe you are, a, a, maybe that is incentivizing swapping to, between identities in some sense. I think that's um, that's a reasonable point. I'm trying to contrast it with something like Dark Wallet, where they, they're they actually trying to design something into the interface to help people keep their identities separate with this pocket thing. I haven't actually looked at it in a little while, but. Um, that was sort of what I inferred that they were trying to do uh, with it. So there's no swapping of anything in there. They're actually saying, like, hey, why don't you have a section of addresses called a pocket? You give it a label, and you say, this label is, um, I'm going to do all of my transactions related to localbitcoins.com for John Doe 123 in this pocket. And then if I pretend to be John Doe 124, that has, there's another pocket for that. And ideally, the wallet should be making sure that you're not, um, for example, sending inputs from multiple pockets uh, to keep the identity separate. Does that make sense? Yeah, so we're talking about two different ways um, to aid privacy. One is like ease of completely switching identities, maybe even on separate hardware systems or whatever. And the other is, within the same system, a way to try to separate out identities or use cases or whatnot. Um, and I don't think, I don't know if we necessarily would want to prefer, uh, you know, weight one or the other better, right? It's, you know, if they both achieve the same goal, that's great. But uh, maybe that's one metric in and of itself, and, and these can be subcategories, how, how will they aid one or the other. Yeah, with um, pretty much what, uh, well, kind of what I assume they're doing with Dark Wallet is kind of similar with ours. We're deriving a new, like, keychain from the seed, basically. And you know, in, in our wallet, we call it an account. They call it a, a pocket. Um, and so it's just, it, it's just two different um, kind of sets of keys all derived from the same seed. The thing you have to keep in mind, though, is... It it won't it wouldn't be using like like there wouldn't be any kind of cross contamination where you're you know, pulling coins from one chain from using it in, in another one. Um, but with at least then you do have to worry like when you're like broadcasting transactions if you're sending it to the same server that server might know you know the, the, it receives one transaction from from one set and then another one from another set they both came from the same source. So that you have to be careful with that. Um, ours one, once I implement the um, the bloom filter fix, it's going to be uh, th there's going to be like a complete separation there. It's gonna you're gonna have like one set of nodes for each account that you connect to, um, and so if you'll like broadcast and then receive transactions from from those different sets of nodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really, really good point. So um, this is a, this is another, uh, just something for me to kind of keep in the back of my mind that I wanted to mention. So when I was writing my paper on Darkcoin, what I did, and I think that people should do in the future when they write about uh, cryptocurrency privacy, is you have to break it down into different kinds of attackers or roles or however, whatever you want to call them. There's one attacker that just looks at the blockchain and he doesn't have access to anything else or maybe he has access to like Twitter or you know other public sources of information. There's another attacker who is the person that you're sending bitcoins to. Um, there's another attacker who is uh, someone that 
you receive bitcoins from. There's another attacker called your the the server that's helping you mix the coins. If it's a server, uh, if the server is helping to mix the coins. So like depending on what access to information you have, you have to break it down into these different topics. So those are uh, Chris just brought up two different things. Like one is. Um, uh, what are you betraying to the other peers on the network through broadcasting your filters, or if it's server-based, what are you betraying to that server versus um, what are you giving away to just the blockchain, right? Are you mixing inputs from different pockets or accounts or whatever? It's kind of two different attackers that you have to consider. Um, yeah. I don't know. I haven't thought at all yet about how that should factor, if at all, into these scoring systems, but just sort of something to keep in mind. I think it because it it is it is for example worse to betray something to the blockchain than it is to betray something to the person you're sending bitcoins to or even your dark wallet server that knows about all of your transactions or whatever right because everyone has access to the blockchain not everyone has access to the dark wallet server some people do we don't know who does but so it, it is it is worse to put it out there on the blockchain. I guess that would um, maybe that would factor into the way that we weight these different categories. Basically, if a category involves betraying something to the blockchain, then maybe that should be weighted more highly uh, than betraying it to someone with a different kind of access to information. Yeah, that sort of makes sense to me. All right, cool. Um, all right, let's sort of. Try to blitz through a few more of these. Change backups. We talked about backup a lot. Broadcast. Um, yeah, number. So this one, I'm not really sure how to do it. Um, number of clicks required by the user to use the wallet through Tor or I2P. Um, that's a that's a weird thing to measure. So like, if you're using blockchain.info how many clicks does it take? Well, it's something that you kind of set up before you even connect to the to blockchain.info. I mean, they don't they don't affect that at all. It's not part of their interface. Whereas if you're using, let's say, Bitcoin Core, you have to pass a few like command line arguments or something like that to start it up and point it or you actually you can go into their little settings GUI and point it at your um, your Tor proxy. Uh, Sox proxy. So I'm actually not sure how to compare those two. Like, how would you compare how difficult it is to use blockchain info with Tor versus using Bitcoin Core with Tor? Well, <clears throat> could, do we just have to do it as binary, or maybe not binary, but you know, one of three or four choices? Either one is, you know, it's default, you know, or or two is it's easily configurable, or three it's not. I, I don't know, because I, clicks, I agree, it's going to be a pretty difficult metric on this one. Yeah, I like that approach. I'm just going to note that down real quick. So for um, default. All right, can you just repeat it again? You said default. What were the, some of the other possible options? Uh, yeah, I was just saying, you know, one is default, two is easily configurable, three is uh, maybe really tough to set up. I, you know, these are, of course, subjective. And then four is just not possible. Great. Uh, I, can, uh, I can work on those a bit more, but that's a good place to start. I like that. That's helpful. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think it, and as far as like Tor versus ITP goes, I mean, I like Tor more for various reasons, but I'm thinking of just treating them basically a different uh, the equivalent. I actually haven't seen any wallets that use ITP and not Tor so far. Um, there are some altcoins that do that, but I haven't seen any Bitcoin wallets that do that, so it's. I'm just going to treat them the same, I think. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Sam, you mentioned uh, last time that um, uh, kind of one of the downsides with Open Bazaar would be having the... Um, configure like your your uh, machine to run as a hidden service um, 
like from a usability standpoint, you uh, consider what I'm I'm probably going to be doing. I know there there's like a there's a Java library that I'm I'm checking out now. Um, that is really kind of designed you to you include like a, a Tor binary in in your package, and it you can like progr programmatically configure it to run as a hidden service. So it uh, kind of does the improves the user experience, so they don't have to uh, configure it themselves. You consider doing anything like that? Yeah, uh, but I'd love to, to talk to you about it. Um, we're actually going through some network changes right now and looking at maybe somehow using like libtorrent or something. So it would be it'd be great to think more deliberately about how we can do Tor because that's been it's been something that uh, it, we've been looking at a lot. But we would love to yeah to have your feedback on that. All right, cool. All right, good deal. Um, okay, a couple, couple more th categories that I'll go through real quick. A sender privacy, basically what I have in there for now is like um, how many clicks to tell your client to do some type of uh, mixing. Um, right now, um, I think the only like included mixers that I'm aware of are all peer-to-peer -peer at this point. They're all coin join based. So... I also had something in here about um, um, whether the mixer was sort of centralized or not, but I don't actually, I'm not actually aware of any clients anymore that do that. But uh, yeah, so number of clicks to um, get stuff mixed. And then on the feature side, um, trying to like quantify how useful that is, um, where I'm starting out is number of other users whose funds are mixed with yours when you send through the mixing process. Uh, originally, I phrased that as like the anonymity set, but that's actually a pretty comp like complicated mathematical thing. Um, so, yeah, I think um, considering the number of other users that are going to have their funds mixed with yours is probably a pretty good way of doing it. And right now, in terms of wallets that even support anything like that, there's Blockchain Info's Shared Coin, there's um, Dark Wallet. Um, I think that's it for GUI-based things. I know Airbits may have something like that down the line. I know Chris has talked about doing something like that in his client, but it's not there yet, if I understand correctly. Yeah, in fact... Um... Tim Ruffing uh, just got back to me, uh, who did the original Coin Shuffle paper. He talked to him today, so I think he's going to kind of. He said he's going to start focusing on Coin Shuffle again, so hopefully we can speed it up a little. Very cool. Um, what is he doing with Coin Shuffle? Well, he wrote the original paper. Um, on yeah. It. So what's his next so, step? Like, what is uh, how is he going to be promoting it, or is he going to write a? An implementation, a library. Uh, what is he looking for? Um, well, last I know, he uh, he was looking to implement it in a wallet. So I, I'm just like, because I hadn't heard from him. He was like busy for like a month or two, so I hadn't heard from him. But um, yeah, so I I just kind of went through all the work that I've I've kind of done in the meantime and and sent it to him. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think Did he's you interested. Get it implement it in your wallet or a different one. Well, I'm definitely gonna like use him as kind of like a consultant on the shuffle part of it, and I, at least if the the actual protocol, yeah, I mean, if he wants to work with me on it, then that would be great too. Okay, cool. Well, that's very good to hear. Um, a notable person that works on dark wallets without naming any names. Uh, when I first told him about Coin Shuffle, he was like, why did they give this uh, its own name? It's just like a slight variant of CoinJoin. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think it's more than that, honestly, but... Okay, um, yeah, mixing stuff. So... Does that guy? Uh, so yeah, I wanted to hear your feedback. Um, number of other users whose funds are being mixed with yours. Does that sort of make sense as a metric to you? 
Yeah. Uh, this may be pedantic, but is it like number of users or number of inputs, or does that not matter? Well, so for example, let's say you mixed with one other person and each push person put in 50 inputs, you still, for any given input, there's a 50% chance that it belongs to you. So um, even though there would be 100 inputs, so I'm not sure that increasing the number of inputs necessarily helps with that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The tricky thing about the mixing is like, so for example, with shared coin, they're doing some mixing, but they did a, a bad job of it. Um, as I sort of showed in my research, and how do you quantify how good of a job are they doing? I don't, it's it's really complicated. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to address that currently. Um, but well, their issue wasn't they weren't using like size outputs, right? They were sometimes using like-sized outputs, but not all of the time. Yeah. This might be another case of uh, trial and error to get the metric right, you know? Yeah, it you're may, right. It may, be, it may be more difficult to just think what it's going to be beforehand, but once we actually go through trying to test it, it may become more clear. Yeah. I mean, the coin join stuff is really subtle, too, because, like, you can, for example, kind of get the... Um, like your inputs don't always have to be the same size, but they have to add up to the same amounts and so forth. They weren't even doing that, so it's um, it's it's a bit. It can get pretty pedantic, uh, but it's a good place to start to just be like, are you mixing stuff or not? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so that's sender privacy. Um, receiver privacy is just about stealth addresses. Um, which, uh, as far as I understand, you could have other kinds of elliptic curve Duffy Hellman addresses, so I'm just calling them that for now, uh, that are not per se stealth addresses. Um, where else did I see that? Um, oh, like, so uh, these uh, crypto notes has Duffy Hellman addresses too. Um, they're not quite stealth addresses, like, I guess you could call them, I don't know, they don't call them self-addresses. So um, I think that maybe the catch-all term is just elliptic curve Diffie Hellman. But yeah, so a number of number of clicks that it would take you to generate a, an elliptic curve Diffie Hellman address. Um, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm doing this in terms of like the number of clicks from the default window or authenticated home page, but I wonder if it should be more like number of clicks necessary to deviate from whatever the default sending or receiving process is. Um, because, yeah, because the, the way that your GUI is set up can make a big difference. Like, if it takes you several... I, I think I mentioned this before. Like, if it takes you three clicks to get to your receiving page, but it's already um, elliptic curve, if it's already self addresses by default, that's fine. That's pretty good. Um, if it takes you one click to get to receive and another click to do the Diffie, the Diffie Hellman addresses, that's actually a lower number, but it's not more privacy encouraging actually, because you have to do an extra click during the receive process. So um, I think I may change that. Um, broadcast privacy. We talked about Tor. Hey, Justice. It's probably a mic muted for the moment. Um, broadcast privacy. And then um, there's all this stuff about like filtering. And um, so if you're just a full node and you get all of the transactions, then that's great. Like, you're in good shape as far as the broadcast stuff goes. Um, if you... Well, as far as receiving broadcasts goes. Um, I... Yeah, I'm still confused about how to delineate the... Um, like, the bloom filtering stuff and whatnot. I could probably... I'll work on it some more, but I could probably use some more help from Chris with that, because I... I find it pretty confusing. 
Sure. And we talked about the identity separation uh, stuff before. I think I've already got some more uh, material to work on that, I'll hammer on that some more from you guys, so I appreciate that. Um, so I think that's all that, that I wanted to go uh, over with the two of you. Is there anything else that you wanted to uh, mention or bring up? No, nothing on my end. All right, cool. I, I would also uh, also wanted to mention. Um, so as far as like the the overall Open Bitcoin Privacy Project goes, um, and interest and so forth, we had uh, a little bit of media coverage a week or two ago, and um, I from time to time I keep getting contacted by people that want to get involved in these projects. Um, they're usually in, interested in individual projects. I also had one guy, I'm not going to name him right now because this is live and I don't know if he wants to put it out there yet, but um, uh, a very well-known uh, Bitcoin person that's interested in uh, supporting the project. Um, and uh, through organizational or, or uh, legal means or whatever, he's just he's interested in the idea of there being an organization that is uh, uh, sort of promoting Bitcoin privacy. So uh, cool. we'll sort of wait and see where that goes, but uh, I'm definitely getting more and more interest. And what I'm hoping is that this will act as a, in addition to this, you know, this wallet privacy metric stuff that we're working on ongoing. I'm hoping that that I will act as a funnel to send uh, people and money your way uh, for the different projects that you guys are working on. So I just wanted to give you a little update on that. Cool. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Um, I think um, I'm just going to talk with Justice for a bit offline, but uh, uh, we may as well wrap up the broadcast. So thanks, everyone, for coming along and watching. Um, if you're interested in participating next time that we have a meeting, um, the best way to just get in touch with the organization, you can go to our, our website at uh, Open bitcoinprivacyproject.org. Um, there's a mailing list that we use. Um, you can, uh, and if you want to jump on these Google Hangouts and, and participate, uh, whether you want to talk about these projects or you want to bring up your own project or just talk about Bitcoin privacy stuff, that's all well and good. Um, so you can you can hit us up on IRC on uh, Freenode, where hashtag or pound sign OPPB on uh, on uh, Freenode. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks so much for your help today. Thank you. Thanks, Christoph.